there's not loads and loads of Bible reading today, but then at the same time there might be, so we'll just see how it goes. So please feel free to join in with us. Those of you that join, uh, the reason that we've got it all on microphone is not simply because uh, you're deaf, or I think that you're deaf, or that I think that my voice is so quiet that I need the amplification, but mainly because we record these Bible studies so that you can go back to them and you can listen to them on YouTube and you can keep going back through them and obviously hopefully drawing in them. And we've done a lot of Bible studies in the five years I've been here, but we've not recorded them all. We have recorded these ones. So we're going to turn now to Zechariah chapter 7. Hopefully you've got that in front of you. And we'll have a read around. <laughs> I knew I was going to do that. My apologies. Now in the fourth year of King Darius, it came to pass that the word of the Lord came to Zechariah on the fourth day of the ninth month of Chislev. When the people sent Sherez with Regem Melech, and his men to the house of God to pray before the Lord, and to ask the priests who were in the house of the Lord of hosts and the prophets, saying, Should I weep in the fifth month and fast, as I have done for so many years? Verse 4. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came uh, to me, saying, Say to all the people of the land and to the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months, during those 70 years, did you really fast for me? Uh, for, for me? When you eat and when you, you, when you drink, do you not eat and drink for yourselves? Should you not have obeyed the words which the Lord proclaimed through the four prophets when Jerusalem and the cities around it were inhabited and prosperous, and the south and the lowland were inhabited, they say. Then the message came to Zechariah from the Lord. This is what the Lord of heaven's army says. Judge fairly and show mercy and kindness to one another. Do not oppress widows, orphans, foreigners, and the poor. Do not scheme against each other. Your ancestors refused to listen to this message. They stumbly turned away and put their fingers in their ears to keep them from hearing. They made their hearts as hard as stone so they could not hear the instructions or the message that the Lord of Heaven's armies had sent them by his spirit through the earlier prophets. That is why the Lord of Heaven's armies was so angry with them. Since they refused to listen when I called to them, I would not listen when they called to me, says the Lord of Heaven's armies. As a whirlwind scatters them among the distant nations where they lived as strangers, their land became so desolate that not even the, that no one tr even travelled through it and turned their, they turned their pleasant land into a desert. Amen. Thank you very much. So, another short one. And I said to you last week, for those of you that were here and those who have listened to it, that um, the messages in Zechariah now are harder to hear but simpler to understand. The messages that have been prior to this in the first six chapters have been hard to understand, but really easy to hear, because they've been really encouraging and very exciting. And of course, what is it that Zechariah is prophesying about? What's his time period? Well, just to remind you, he is prophesying in what we call the post-exile period. So after the children of Israel have been carried away to Babylon, and after the 70 years that Jeremiah prophesied that they would be there, Cyrus gave them leave to come back. And after moanings and years of moanings and suffering and going through all the things that they did, first under the Babylonians, and then when the Babylonians were conquered by the Persians, then under the Persians, when their opportunity came to actually go back to Jerusalem, only 10% of all of those that did, did kind of when that opportunity came for God to answer the prayer. It's funny how people can moan about something and then they say, right, well, you could do it. Oh, no, I don't want to do it. <laughs> and that's exactly where they were. They went back with the one specific aim. Cyrus sent them back and was willing to pay that they would build the temple. It took them a very long time. And, of course, they got discouraged because their enemies, the locals, didn't want a strong resurgent temple of God anymore. And so they wrote letters that were not lies, but they were their past. And the past is always something hard to shake off. The simple truth of sending to 
the person who's in charge of saying, well, look in the history books, this is what they did. And the Israelites couldn't come back and say, well, no, we never did that because it was absolutely true. But because that's what they were, it doesn't mean that's what they are now. And they were said, look, they're rebellious. They rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. They'll rebel against you. They will do all of these things. And so they stopped building all together. And Zechariah in these first six chapters, along with Haggai, encouraged them to rebuild the temple. Why is this temple important? Because this is the one that Jesus would walk in, would be dedicated in, and in the end, the one that Jesus himself would prophesy would be destroyed. And that puts us in this kind of weird situation. Because the prophets that were before the exile were all prophesying that you are going to go through this because you will not listen to me. And because you won't listen to me, in the end, this is what will happen. You'll be carried away. And everything will be destroyed. But I will bring you back and I will restore everything and I will be your God and I will be your king. So why does it get destroyed again? And we're going to look at that more now in these chapters as to why the Romans go and do exactly the same thing that the Babylonians did in almost exactly the same way. Nebuchadnezzar had no intention of destroying the temple. But during the fighting, accidentally, uh, a torch got thrown through one of the windows of the temple and the fire engulfed, it caught the wood and of course because there was so much gold and there was so much silver, there was no way Nebuchadnezzar was leaving that all lying around. So he took every stone off the temple and because it was porous rock, they would douse it and fill it and fill it with as much water as they could and then set a fire under it. And what would happen is the water itself, of course, would turn into steam. The chemical reaction would actually cause the rock to explode so that they could get at the gold. And so, unintentionally, exactly what the Lord said would happen, happened. And that is exactly what happened when the Romans did it in 70 AD. Nobody had the intention of destroying it. And you could go to Rome now and you could see a Parthenon. It, it's kind of like a big tri uh, arc, a bit like the Arc de Triomphe that's in Paris, but it's the Italian one. And on it, it's got a picture of the menorah and the Star of David. And what it is, it's an image of all the things that Titus, who was the Caesar at the time, stole from Israel and brought back to Rome for their goodness and for their kingdom, and they melted it down and put it to their gods of Athens and Zeus and all of the statues that came along like that. And exactly what God said would happen the first time happened, not just the first time, the second time. Now that's really important. Zechariah was called to prophesy, and the first six chapters that we have read up till now have been talking about encouraging these guys who'd stopped building to build. And last week we ended it with this great phrase that at the end of it, Zechariah points out who will actually build the temple. It says the branch will build the temple. Now in Hebrew, the word branch is Nazar. And Matthew too tells us that Jesus went to live in Nazareth just like the prophet said. But no prophet ever said Jesus would live in Nazareth. Hence why all of the, the leaders, the religious leaders, had a big problem with Jesus being from Nazareth although he was born in Bethlehem. So what's Matthew on about? Well, Nazar. Jesus was a Nazarene because he was born in Nazareth. Well, he lived in Nazareth and he spoke with a Nazareth accent because that meant he was of the town of the branch. He was a Nazar. And you could say Matthew's playing with words there, but he had no problem saying in his gospel, just as God said. And Zechariah makes it abundantly clear to us that it's not just the Messiah, but it will be the Son of God who comes from Nazareth, who will be a branch that shoots out of Israel, and from him people will come from all over the world to come and build. Because whilst they were building a physical temple, the Lord is refer referring to us 
that we are building spiritually. As 1 Corinthians 3 tells us, we build on one another with works of the Spirit, which means things that are done as the Lord has commanded, and the Lord has ordered us, and the Lord has stepped us as the great architect and knows what the whole place is supposed to look like. You put this on there because that should go there. He is the architect. And he was crowned. Now that's the first six chapters. It contained one prophecy in many parts. The woman in the basket, the scroll, the four gospel writers, all of these things. And its entire purpose to encourage the builders to build through fear and discouragement they had stopped. But now they were building. Just turn with me to Haggai chapter 1, verse 14 to 15. Because let's have a look at what Haggai and Zechariah were able to achieve. Haggai 1, 14 to 15, which is only the book before Zechariah. So the Lord spite the enthusiasm of Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and the enthusiasm of Jeshua, son of Zehodak, the high priest, and the enthusiasm of the whole remnant of God's people. They began to work on the house of their God, the Lord of Heaven's armies, on the 21st of September, the second year of King Darius's reign. So we see... They'd stopped working. They weren't doing anything. And what was the success of what Zechariah and Haggai had done? They all got off their backsides and started building again. They regarded and didn't care now what they were saying, what their enemy was saying about them. They heard the word. They understood the necessity of what they were called to do. And they got up and they began to build. And they began to build on the second year. Now let's turn to Ezra chapter 5. Let's have a look at verses 1 to 5. This is not, this is written by Ezra, but Ezra wasn't there at the time. This is still the time of Zerubbabel. What does it tell us that they did? Ezra chapter 5 and verse 1 to 5. Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophets prophesied to the Jews who's, who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, who was over them. So Zerubbabel, the son of Sh- him, and Jeshua, son of Jehozadak, uh, uh, rose up and began to build the house of God, with, which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, helping them. At the same time, Tetanai, the governor of the region beyond the river, and Shathar Bosnai, and their companions came to them and spoke thus to them, Who has commanded you to build this temple and finish this wall? Then accordingly, we told them the names of the men who were constructing this building. Verse 5. Yeah. Right. But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, so that they could not make them cease till a report could go to Darius. Then a written answer was returned concerning this matter. The very people who had come to try and stop them to build them, remember they hadn't been building for 15 years. Imagine being called to do something and not doing it for 15 years. Just sitting around, losing purpose, losing will, not even knowing why you're there or you're in this place or you're in this situation whatsoever. Zechariah and Haggai have been called by the Lord to get them to build. We've learned that it encouraged the people in Zerubbabel and all of those with them said, right, let's build, let's get on with it. And then when the enemy comes again and went, hang on a second, did I say you could build? This time they didn't give in to him. They didn't listen to him. They didn't answer him. This time they weren't building as individuals. They were building as a group. And the fear that had paralyzed them had completely drained away. They understood something. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. And now they were building, not in their own ability, in their own strength. Remember, they were a ruined nation. They came back as a vassal state. They weren't even a real place. 
the only equipment that they had to build was given to them. But that in itself is supernatural. Because here's this heathen, godless king named Cyrus, whom Isaiah, 200 years earlier, had prophesied about. Said, he is my anointed one. Cyrus names him. And there's no indication that he ever accepted Christ as his Savior or he believed in the Lord. He just added God to all the other gods that he worshipped. But the Lord still used this amazing situation to provide them with everything that they needed to get on with the work that they were called to do. They couldn't have done it of themselves naturally, but supernaturally. God provided everything naturally. In other words, it didn't just awake and there was a pile of wood that had somehow grown out of the ground and kindly cut itself into logs and into lumber and into planks. But people who had done that brought that and gave it to them for no real reason other than the Lord was in it. And now because they believed it, they didn't build as individuals which can be picked off when we work in our own strength or when we work under our own name, you can easily be picked off. You could stand there and try and do it in your strength, and they'll, of course, go, the whole enemy will come against you and remind you and send things against you. But when we stand as a unit, we are protected. They refuse to give their names, but just the name of the one who called them to this work, the Lord. Now, if we return to... Ezra 6.15, we learn something about this building work. And this is important that we get this in our head now. Ezra 6.15. And then after that, you can go back to that. What does Ezra 6.15 say? And this temple was completed on the third day of the month of Adar. It was the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. So, we learn having been encouraged to build, having been shown that it's the strength of the Lord, having realized it's by supernatural means that everything has come about, and if God is for them, then what weapon that's formed against them can stand, and they get on with it. They remember that in the second year, they finish it by the sixth year. Four years. And they had 15 years off. Imagine how far on they could have been if they hadn't had 15 years off. But four years it took them to build that temple. It took them a lot longer to build the foundations, but we see the foundations now. That's the Wailing Wall that people go to. Uh, And they've been added to by Solomon and others. Uh, Sorry, not Solomon, uh, by Herod and others. But they built that foundation so that the Temple Mount could sit and that the temple could be built on it. It took them four years. In the sixth year of Darius. Now let's get back to Zechariah. What does Zechariah 7 1 tell us is the time that this prophecy began, this whole new series. It says, Now in the fourth year of King Darius. So what does that mean? They haven't finished when Zacharias starts to prophesy again. But they're halfway finished. If you ever like watching these building programs like Grand Designs, and I've got to say I am a sucker for them now and again when they're on, what you see is Colin McLeod coming and giving them loads and loads of hassle all the time because they've spent an absolute fortune and at the moment it's still just a muddy field. And the answer for that is because usually the first three, well, the first three months is arguing with the planners over it, and then arguing with an architect over it, and then firing the architect and getting another architect in. But after they've gone through that rigmarole, the next three months has been spending an absolute fortune burying about 100 grand worth of concrete into the ground. But then what comes after that just seems to fly up. They're at this stage now where the building itself is going up. It's the finer detail that takes the slower work towards the end. It's the other bits that come in. So two years in, they're now at the stage where the building is somewhat present. It is very easy to see it. And if you don't know what the geography of Jerusalem looks like, Jerusalem is built on a mountain. 
So the Temple Mount is that, is that exactly. It's on a mount. So as you walk to it, you've got Mount Olivet on one side and then a valley and then the mount that is there. And the most important thing is, is you can see it. That's why at that time when Jesus leaves in the Passion Week and he walks out of the temple and he wipes the dust off his feet and he walks out of Jerusalem and he walks up all of that and the disciples realize he's in a bad mood, trying to lighten the thing, turn to him and go, well, look how beautiful the temple looks in the sun. And Jesus turns around to it and says, oh, I tell you, not one stone will stand on another. Because even though he was such a long way away, it's an impressive image. It can be seen from such a long distance. Of course, anything that's on a mount can be seen from such a long distance. Darwin Tower can be seen. And that's not on a mount, it's just on a big hill. But you can see that from the motorway, you can see that from Bolton, you can see that from Bury, you can see it from all over the place. Because things that are built on hills can see. So here becomes this impressive site. The fourth year. Halfway through the building process. Whilst their minds are still determined to build. And the work is certainly soon finished. So if the first six chapters have been to motivate the people to build with promises and visions of what the purpose of their work would be and whom they were competing against in the woman in the basket, we might wonder, is this next series of prophecies that now begin here to reignite a flame that's gone out? If we remember when we studied the book of Haggai about seven years ago, that they did need to be encouraged again a couple more times. That they would build a bit and stop and build a bit and stop. But that was all in the first few months. Nothing like trying to build in the winter months when everything's still being poured into the ground and it doesn't look like anything's going and you're getting anything done. But the minute you start seeing it come out of the ground, there's absolutely no stopping you. You're completely into it. This is why these people get to this stage and they've borrowed all the money they can from the bank and they've stripped mum and dad and everybody that they know and they've robbed several banks that they're still determined to throw a few more thousand pounds into the thing to make sure it just gets to the end of what the project is because they're at that stage where they're in for a penny so they're in for a pound. They've got to just keep going at it because they can't stop. So by the time of the fourth year, the temple was clearly visible. It would have been harder to stop than to actually keep carrying on. This is not what Zechariah 7 is for. It is not to reignite a flame. Now the Lord is putting a very different message in Zechariah's mouth. But here we have an issue. If the Lord is putting a very different message into Zechariah's mouth, and you might say it's just possibly an issue of interpretation rather than an actual issue with the Bible. And the issue is simple. Why is Zechariah a minor prophet? In length, his message is much longer than Daniel. Daniel is a major prophet. He's one of the four major prophets. You could say, why does that even matter? Does it really matter if he's a major or a minor prophet? It's just something that somebody's called him. It doesn't even say it at the start of the books, major and minor prophet. But remember, each of the major prophets are four separate books. But in the original Hebrew, the 12 minor prophets were one book. And they were meant to be read together. That's why we know that they have a message that follows on from one another. They are in a specific order because you're meant to read them in that order. And the message are not a series of random messages, as we've seen, but they all teach us something very important. And we followed this great path that's taken us through all of these things. And now we're at this rebuilding stage. It does matter. Even from Zechariah's first message, we understand that the number four is significant. There were four horns that represented the kingdoms that stood against Israel and tried to destroy them. But the Lord sent four craftsmen. 
who beat those horns into something else. And we understood that that was alluding to the four gospel writers who, because of this temple that they were building, would come to understand about Jesus, would learn about him, and would write four very different gospels that would go out into the nations to you and I. And those gospel messages would take us who were formerly God's enemies, those kingdoms that stood against the Lord, and we would be changed, transformed by skilled artisans into something completely different. Vessels of peace. Vessels used in his altar. Where does the significance of the number four come from? Why is it important that there are four major prophets and not five major prophets? Well, turn with me to Revelation chapter 4. And let's read verses 6 to 9. This is where we get it from. It comes directly from the throne room. Revelation 4, 6 to 9. In front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and were covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever. What a thing to see, eh? Now, the thing about the book of Revelation that is important for us to understand is the book of Revelation is talking about things that are literal, but not as they literally happen. Who are the four living creatures? Well, they're not angels, otherwise it would say angels. Angelos, messengers. They're not men or humans, because it would say men or mankind. They're four living creatures. So are there four bizarre-looking creatures that stand around the throne of heaven, and what kind of cult have I joined? And the answer, of course, is they're figurative. They're not real. There are not four living creatures that stand around the Lord. These four living creatures, they represent literal things. It is four things that often surround the throne. It is their makeup, what they look like, and of course what they are doing, which helps us understand what they could be. So what they are doing is declaring the holiness of the Lord. They are full of the Spirit. Hence the many eyes, and they fly about, meaning that they're everywhere and can be anywhere. And they see all. And their purpose is to constantly deliver praise to the Lord and to point to him. Here is the Lord. Here is the Lord, constantly pointing. So if they're not real things, as in real creatures, what are they? Well, the children of Israel camped around the tabernacle, which represents the throne room here on earth. Right in the center is the Ark of the Covenant with what sits on it? The mercy seat, the throne of God. And the Shekinah glory of God dwelt between the two cherubim that were on top of that. Hence why when in Indiana Jones they lift the lid off, everybody's face melts. I always did that when I was a child. I guess I didn't go that far. But the glory of God comes down into that. And the children of Israel and their 12 tribes camped around in four different areas. Under four different banners. The banner of an eagle. The banner of an ox. The banner of a lion and the banner of a man's head. So we see. And their tents pointed inwards, not outwards. Outward would make sense, because that's where the enemy's going to come from. 
But they didn't look out at where the enemies come from. They looked towards God. And whenever the glory of God came down, that's when they began to glorify God and began to give praise and worship. The Gospels constantly praise and their purpose is to point out to us who Christ is. And each one of the Gospels points to a different aspect of Christ, but all of them point to the fact that we need to come to Him and that He is holy and that He is fully God. Matthew showing the lion of the tribe of Judah, proving that Jesus is of Israel. Mark showing that Jesus was a suffering servant, a beast of burden like an ox. Luke showing Jesus' humanity. And John showing Jesus from the heavens and eternity. So that's why we have four major prophets and not five major prophets. Daniel, like John, shows God in the heavenlies, in the eternal. Ezekiel, like Luke, uses the praise, Son of Man, all the way through it. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, is the beast of burden and shows that suffering nature. And Isaiah discusses the Messiah more than any of the other prophets put together. It's the prophet that Jesus quotes the most. He is the one that looks at Jesus as being from Israel, just like Matthew did. And yet, shows that he would be fully God. And he, like Jesus, was sent to a people who would ignore him. You see that there's a pattern here. Now you could say, well that's nice and convenient, but it's not really important to me about the way that the, I understand God. But you have to understand that the Bible is important. When you get home on a Sunday evening and you turn the telly on, invariably on Channel 4 there will be some new documentary that blows the lid off Christianity because we found the Gospel of St. Cuthbert that tells us all about that Jesus actually was a woman in a dress and, and something silly like that. And there's always something on like that. Or We found the lost Gospel of Thomas. We found the lost Gospel of Philip. And there are lots of books, we call them apocryphal books, but there are also lots of books that are historical. But they're not the inspired word of God. Only these 66 are. And of course, then you get the question, well, why are these 66 books and not the Gospel of St. Cuthbert that blows the lid off Christianity? Is it convenient that we pick these 66 books? And for those of you who are here on Sunday, you heard me share. Importantly, there is an overarching scarlet thread that weaves through every one of these to show us this message, this love story of a man who loves his woman and is here to save her from herself and bring her back to his home and love her and live with her and make her his equal. So there's a reason that it's important that we know that there are four and not five major prophets. The reason why it is important is because then it explains to us that the Bible is constructed by the Holy Spirit on purpose. And of course you could say that's all exciting, but are you just filling this out because there's not much in Zechariah 7? So that's why you're adding all this at the start. Why does this matter to my understanding of Zechariah chapter 7? And the answer is because, well, what makes something a minor prophet instead of a major prophet? One message. The, ma the major prophets have got lots of messages in. Daniel is a short book, but I tell you, the stuff that's in there from... Every chapter is practically a completely different message from the Lord that comes in there. But the minor prophets are not minor because what they say is insignificant or not as important as what the majors say, but because the Lord has given to them just one message to share. And what we need to understand, and it's very important, we understand that the minor prophets may have prophesied far more than is written down in each one of their books. I mean, take Jonah. Jonah prophesied, but the book of Jonah doesn't contain a single one of his prophecies. In fact, it's a prophetic book without a single prophecy in it. It's a story about a prophet, but it's in the prophetic literature. 
In fact, Jonah's prophecy is contained in the book of Kings. A prophecy he didn't want to give, a prophecy that he ended up giving, and a prophecy that in the end he decided he didn't want anything more to do with God over after he gave it. So we have to understand the minor prophets only have one message, although it may have many facets of it. And if today we're talking about Zechariah 7 being a very different message from the one that was in Zechariah 1 to 6, where it was designed to motivate the people to build, and if we understand that Zechariah 7 and 8 fit together as a message to a question asked, which is the question here in chapter 7, by these two visitors and the people that came with them, and then goes on to be the reason for the remaining chapters, then we have to ask, if minor prophets are only supposed to have one message, why does this one have two? How can they fit together? And since he can't be a major prophet, because there can only be four of them, that's three or what's two. And you still might be wondering why is this even important. You just made me go cross-eyed and I don't understand what you're talking about. The answer is because the Bible is a carefully constructed masterpiece by the Lord. It is constructed through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And of course, no one's suggesting that the messages of any of the twelve were their only prophecies, but they are the ones the Lord has chosen to be a part of the Scripture. Think about the many other things that they could have said, but were not relevant to all the ages. Remember Jesus said about the Scriptures, I swear to you that not one jot or title will slip away until it is all fulfilled. What is written in the Old Testament is as still relevant today as it was then. Does that mean we're under the law, Jamie? No, but then the law never saved you. The purpose of the law is to point out to the fact that you need Jesus as Savior. As it teaches us both in Galatians and Hebrews, the law is a schoolmaster. Its job is to chase you to the cross. Once it's done that, it's done its job. It's not to keep beating you once you've got there. Because at the cross, you realize that only Jesus can save you. You don't need to keep hearing that message. Jesus has saved you. So Zechariah has two different messages when he shouldn't. One, to encourage to build a task that is now nearly completed by the time he starts his second set of prophecies. And one, two... What are the prophecies of God? And the remaining eight chapters. He begins with a question. And then there are four messages from the Lord in chapters 7 and 8. Each of them begin with the phrase, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah. So that we understand that Zechariah is not arguing from the law. He is speaking directly what the Lord is saying. They didn't necessarily come and ask the Lord directly for the answer. But the Lord was getting involved. He felt he had something to say. Sometimes, when you're running the show, you've got to get involved. And a plain reading of the chapter would very much suggest that the Lord was quite annoyed with their question in the first place. What it very clearly shows us is that the message that is about to come, the message of these next eight chapters, is one of rebuke. And after that, a description of trials which ends with a promise of full restoration. Now that's light years apart from what we read in chapters 1 to 6, which was entirely about encouragement. Like being built up and not back down again. And we don't want to know that that's what the Lord is doing to us. So, how can these two fit together? How can they be reconciled? Turn with me back to Zechariah 5. Let's read verses 1 to 4. Because how these two things fit together is clearly through a flying scroll. Then I turned and raised my eyes and saw their flying scroll. And he said to me, what do you see? So I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits and its width is 
and its width 10 cubits. Then he said to me, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole earth. Every thief shall be expelled according to this side of the scroll, and every perjurer shall be expelled according to that side of it. I will send out the curse, says the Lord of hosts. It shall enter the house of the thief and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name. It shall remain in the midst of his house and consume it with, it, with its timber and stones. Then the angel who talked with it, me came out and said to me, lift your eyes now and see what it, this is that goes forth. Thank you very much. Now, just in case you can't quite remember what that flying scroll was all about, I do know when it got to the hubs, there was somewhat of confusion sometimes about it. The flying scroll, which was this huge thing, 20 cubits, almost the length of the minor hall. You certainly noticed that flying around, didn't you? Again, not something literally happening, but just a description of something. The scroll was written on two sides. That is unusual. There are only a few documents that are written on both sides. The reason that they don't usually write on both sides is so that you don't go through to the other side and smudge what's on one side and you can't make out what you read either side. But it's important because this is a curse. This curse goes, and by flying it means it goes throughout the earth and it's checking. And it's looking for people who are, of course, breaking the law. But the specific things that it calls about is it's talking about things that can be summed up as not loving your neighbor and not loving the Lord. When Jesus is asked to sum up the law, what's the phrase that he uses? Yes, yes, yes. Love your neighbor as yourself, and the other one? That's it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. But not only does Jesus sum all the law up like that, so do the Pharisees. So when the lawyer tries to trick Jesus, what's the most important law? Jesus turns the question back on him and says, well, what do you think the most important law is? And he says, love the Lord, the Lord your God of all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus goes, oh, well done. You're not very far from the kingdom. And the guy who was there to cause Jesus to harm, he walks over and oh, I feel quite good about myself. He forgets that he was there to cast stones at Jesus. Because all the law can be fulfilled if you just follow those two things. Now, in the New Testament, we're given love one another as Christ loved us. The law of love is an important one. It's not just important, it's vital. One John goes on to say, if you can't do it, you can't possibly be saved. Because it's my nature coming through you. And if you don't want to do that, then how can you say you love me? You don't know me. You don't even see me. You see one another, but you don't care about one another. This is why people who say, well, you know, I love the Lord, but I don't like the church. Grow up. Because Jesus loves the church, and we should love what he loves. If you're looking for the perfect church, please don't join it. You will ruin it. <laughs> so the actual truth is, there's no such thing. We've all got issues. In fact, that's what Matthew 13 shows when it gives us these parable kingdoms, what the kingdom of heaven is like. They all show, actually, the minute it touches our humanity, it goes a bit bad. And the seven churches in the book of Revelation, well, one of them is about to have an affair with another woman. One of them's dead. One of them is like a tomb, and Jesus says, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to take the church from you. One of them's really good, Philadelphia bloody two shoes. And one of them doesn't even know it's bad. And that's the church that Jesus loves. So he fully understands our nature. Maybe we should start to fully understand it a little bit more. Perfection is in heaven, not on earth. And perfection will not come on earth, no matter how hard you try to do it. Because, as Mike has already taught us, thank you, Micah, that sin is a pandemic disease that needs to be eradicated by burning the body that it's within. Hence why we will receive a new heavenly body. Because even the perfect reign of Jesus 
that 1,000 year millennial reign will still not eradicate sin and people will still choose the devil even though he hasn't been around. So we have this flying scroll. The curse that will destroy the building if the building wasn't built right. And how do you build the building right? By loving the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and your mind and loving your neighbor as yourself by walking in the Spirit. Now we know from the New Testament that when we get to the Jews who are in the temple that these guys are building, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and even the high priest, that they are by far not loving the Lord their God with all their heart, all their soul and all their mind. And they don't love the neighbors themselves, as proved by the parable of the Good Samaritan. The guy isn't dead. There's no law to say I shouldn't be helping him, but he might die. And then I'd be unclean. So I'm going to err on the side of caution, and I'm just going to let him die. And I'm going to use the law of God to justify such inhumane and ungodlike actions. The Lord who says of Israel, I saw you squirming in your own blood, and I set aside, and I called you for myself. But they couldn't do that. And of course, we know that they didn't love the Lord their God because they blasphemed God to his very face, and slapped him around it, and pulled his beard out, and sent him to be crucified. So did they build the temple right? After all those six messages, those encouraging chapters, they were building and they're still building and they're full of joy and they're excited. But they weren't building it right. And of course, after their persecution and hatred of Jesus, because they loved their own position rather than acknowledging Jesus as the Son of God, that by 70 AD, this temple was ripped down again. Why? Because the flying scroll curse told us, if you don't build it right, you will start again. And that was the first thing that Jesus said. We read it in John. Not that he hadn't even called the disciples. Turning the tables over at the very first of his Passovers. Who gave you the authority to do this? What sign do you prove to us that you have the authority to do this? Tear down this temple. And three days later, I will build it. Oh, it took us 42 years. Yes, because you took 15 of them off. So you can already beat your time scale. That's where they are. What these next two chapters show us is why Zechariah had been encouraged them to build. But now, Zechariah shows he didn't build it right. So we're going to have to build it again. And for those who were building in the Spirit, when we hear that, that it isn't two different messages, it's the same message, build the temple, only build it right. Or you will have to start again. We might say, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go around the wilderness several times. I want to get it right the first time. So I need to learn the lesson of what they did wrong that proves so that I don't do that and my temple isn't ripped down and I have to start again. I need to be able to build it in the way that the Lord has called me to build it. So what did they do wrong? So let's get into it. A group of men led by Sherez, which sounds like a wine, and Regen Melik was sent to this very nearly finished temple to ask a question. And before they've even asked the question, we can see that there's something very clearly wrong. Where had the men been sent from? 
and by who? Were they sent from Bethel? No, Bethel didn't exist at this stage. There's some of your Bibles trying to translate some of the names, aren't they? What they're trying to do is they're trying to translate Shirez and change it into a Hebrew name. But it's not. It's an Assyrian name. So the Bibles that have tried to change it then into a Hebrew understanding will get to Bethel. But the Hebrew of Bethel is Bethel. It isn't Shirez. Sometimes Bible translators don't like the message. So they change the message a bit. The Assyrian name here, Shirez, and the Babylonian name, Regen Melech, indicate to us they have come from Babylon. And we can guess that because of their name. Now, since the question is about religious observances, and only the Jews were following the religious observances of Judaism, as far as they could without a temple, it would be something only Jews would have asked about. So we can see that they have come from Babylon and they were sent by the Jews who were still living in Babylon. And the other thing that really proves that to us is they would never have got an audience with the priests and with the prophets were they not Jews. Because remember, all of the other nations assembled were trying to destroy them and pull them down. And Micah already read to us from Ezra 5, they weren't listening to anybody. They weren't letting them into the camp. They were just getting on with the work. So when some Jews come back from Babylon to come and ask some questions, they were sent by the Jews of that place. And most likely they were Jews, otherwise they would never have got anywhere near. So what's wrong with all of that? Well, firstly, it's a bit rich to turn up and inquire of the Lord in a nearly constructed temple that you spent all your time being nowhere near its construction. On behalf of all the other people, the 90% of people who decided not to come, not to help, not to send any money, not to send any encouragement, but now you've done it, do you mind if we ask the Lord a few questions? We didn't believe you could do it. We never had the faith that you could do it. We thought it was a ridiculous idea you could do it. Well, you've done it. Can we get involved? It is a little rich. That you have watched those work when you had absolutely no part in it at all, and that was your choice. You know, people join us, they come from all over because they didn't know us. The Lord calls people from all over. But these are people that knew what was going on and had deliberately made the choice not to come. They wanted to hear from the Lord, but they did not want to build in the kingdom because it wasn't finished. And they weren't saying, we've come to help you finish. They were saying, we just want to come and ask the Lord a few questions. Tell us when you're done and we can come again. We'll see how you finish the extension off. It'll be lovely. Secondly, they were still holding on to their Babylonian and Assyrian names. And what their names are absolutely cries out. Regen Melik means an Israelite of the king of Persia of the king, Melech, Persian king. I am his man. I'm not God's man. I'm the leader of this world's man. I'm a Jew who's under the authority of the ruler of this age. I'm building you the woman in the back. And Cherise named after a character that we actually find both in Isaiah. But just have a look at this. It's 2 Kings 19, verse 37. It 
2 Kings chapter 19 and verse 35. Go for it, you showered. <laughs> and it came about as he was worshipping in the house of Nisroch, his god, that Adramelech and Shazerazet, oh, I can't even say that either, killed him with the sword and they escaped into the land of Ararat. And the Esau had and his son became king in his place. Whom are they? Well, the king of Assyria was worshipping at his godless god. When his son, a rebellious son, came in and stabbed him in the back. But this wasn't a play for be king. It was an utter act of rebellion. Having done it, he bolted for the, the coast. So we have two characters. One who says, I am the god of this ages man. And the other one who is named after a son who in rebellion against his own nation killed his own father and ran away. We come to inquire of the Lord. What a contrast to the men at the end of chapter 5. These were men humbled by the fact that they didn't come back when the rest of the Jews could build. They came, shamed so, and they changed their names. They no longer kept the Babylonian names. And if you're wondering how do I know they had Babylonian names, we get that from the beginning of Daniel. Everybody who was transported to Babylon was given a new name. And some of them still kept their Hebrew names, their, their secret names. And at the time of Jesus, the Jews had a Jewish name, a Hebrew name, and some of them had a Greek name. Hence why you get John Mark. And Peter in several different ways. One, because they did dealings with Gentiles, and one when they did dealings with Jews. So they could have two faces. And that was the nature of the word that we could be a Jew in private and we'll be a Gentile in reality. I learned something interesting the other day. This might put you off tapas for the rest of your life. But tapas was invented to catch out Spanish Jewish people or because Jews had been banned from Spain. And many of them pretended to be Catholics so that they could stay within the state. And they would even go to Mass and do all of that, but they were Jewish, and so they invented tapas. You can see if you eat the ham or not. There you go. You'll never eat tapas again. <laughs> and you realize it's part of Torquemada's whole Spanish Inquisition. Yeah. Under all these things going on. So we have these guys who were not like the ones who returned, humbled by their failure to come in the first place. They came bearing their own gold and their own silver to build in the temple. And Zechariah changed that gold into crowns and put it on their heads. And they took that and they cast it at the feet of the high priest. When someone comes to join us, we always look at the manner in which they come. If they come in humility, then that's great. And if they don't, it will always be true. Only those who are prepared to cast their crowns at the feet of Jesus will hear, well done, good and faithful servant, and yet cry out, it's only because of you. I would not be a good and faithful servant, Lord, had you not brought me forth. It's not my own strength, it's your strength. It's not my own skill, it's your skill. I didn't have the capacity. You have given me the capacity. You have made me what I am. You have sustained me in what I am. And you keep making me the man that I am. That's the humble heart. Those who don't do that come with their own pride. And we've had many people in this church who've come with their own plans, demanding that we change our utter policies, our our vision, our direction, our statements to fit in with their plans and their goals instead of in humility coming. So, what do you think 
are the plans of the delegation on behalf of those who are not prepared to pay the cost or even come and return to do the work? What is it? What are their plans? Now, to the Jewish reader, even today, even Jewish people today, they would read this, it would become abundantly clear where the issue was. To ourselves, it doesn't necessarily jump out. We can see that they're asking if they can start fasting and weeping and having this day of mourning in the fifth month. Now let me ask you a question. What festival or feast or fast, we'll say, has the Lord called the people of Israel to do during the fifth month? There isn't one. The fifth month, the number five, hence why there isn't five minus major prophets, has no significance to this. None. In fact, if we read in Zechariah 7 verse 5, we read, Say to all the people of the land and to the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seven months during those 70 years, did you really fast for me? we can see it was just something they had done in this 70-year exile period. In the time that they were carried away into Babylon until this moment, prior to that they never had a fast on the fifth month. But since that occasion, for those 70 years, and what has been added to it, they have fasted on this day. Why? I'm going to pull on a commentator now called Kielich who's looked into this. And Jewish people today still fast on these days. They've also added one more to coincide with the Romans, which is going to find out. And this is what it is. I'm going to look at quite a few scriptures to help us find it. During the captivity, the Israelites had adopted the custom of commemorating the leading incidents in the Babylonian catastrophe. They decided that they would fast and weep and wail on the days that they thought were significant about their own destruction. They kept fast days in the 5th, 7th, 4th, and 10th month. So let's have a look at them. In the 5th month and on the 10th day, because, well, let's turn to Jeremiah 52. And let's read verses 12 to 13. What happened on that anniversary? Jeremiah 52, verse 12 to 13. Now in the, now in the fifth month, on the tenth day of, of the month, which was the 19th year of the king Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Nebi, Nebuchadnezzar, the, the captain of the guard who served the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He, he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house, all the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great, he burned with fire. So what happened on the fifth month, the tenth day of the fifth month? Jerusalem was burnt down. So, on that day, when the temple was burnt down, they would fast. So why do you think they've come to ask now if they can stop doing that? Because there's a temple going back up again. Hold on to that thought. Now let's have a look at 2 Kings 25, and verses 25 to 26. This is the seventh month. And they fasted on the third day. Twenty-five to twenty-six. But it happened in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishma, of the royal family, came with ten men and struck and killed Gedaliah the Jews, as well as the Chaldeans who were with him at Mizpah. 
and all the people, small and great, and the captains of the armies arose and went to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. So on this day, the seventh month and the third day, they commemorated that Gedelius, who was the governor of the land, was killed. And thus everybody fled to Egypt because they were terrified. So that's another one. Then on the ninth day of the seventh month, so there's two, let's go back to Jeremiah 52 and let's read verses 6 to 7. And you can guess all of these scriptures are reading from Jeremiah 52 or 17 to 25. But Jeremiah 52, 6 to 7. By the fourth month of the ninth day of the month, sorry, Lynn. <laughs> the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then the city wall was broken through, and all the men of the war fled and went out of the city at night by way of the gate between the two walls, which was, which was by the king's garden, even though the Chaldeans were near the city all around. And they went by way of the plain. Now, it's important that we know that this is the 11th year of King Zedekiah. The 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar is when the temple was destroyed. That was the last thing to happen. But this one, what do they remember? This is when Nebuchadnezzar captured Jerusalem. Lastly, in the 10th month, a fast was kept on the 10th day because of 2 Kings 25.1. Second Kings 25 and verse 1. Now it came about in the ninth year of his reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his army against Jerusalem, camped against it, and built a siege wall all around it. So the Jews kept five fast days. One when the temple was burnt down, one when Gedelia was killed, one when the siege began, one when the city walls fell, and one when Zedekiah was killed. But did the Lord tell them to do any of that? No. Not according to the message actually given in Zechariah. Zechariah 7, 6, the Lord says, when you eat and drink, when you do these things, you do them for yourself, not for me. The Lord never told them to do it. What they did, they did simply for themselves because they constantly wanted to keep reminding themselves of this great woe and catastrophe that had happened to them. Some of them may have even gone as far as to say that this woe and catastrophe was brought upon ourselves. But they certainly wanted the woe with me mentality so that five times a year they would go without food and they would cry all day. Imagine being their neighbors. Oh, it's that time again. The Lord didn't tell any of them. Yet, here's the bit that's kind of mind-boggling. God never told them to do it. You could say that they kind of instituted it in an act of piety, trying to show that they were really were very sorry for the situation and the way that they behaved. So when God heard their cry and came down and made it possible for them to now leave, and go back to their own land and start weeping and wailing and fasting for the great calamity that had happened and the destruction of Jerusalem, why did only 10% of them go? What were the other 90% weeping and wailing while everybody's still back in Jerusalem building? Oh Lord, if only you'd returned us to Jerusalem. We're there. We're there. There is no greater hypocrisy than fasting, weeping, and wailing for the Lord to answer your prayer and then reject his answer. God has moved. Why have you not? There are people who have prayed for this church for many years 
And right now they are dead against any movement of God's kingdom. It's crazy. And it wouldn't really seem an unreasonable question. Can we stop fasting now that the building is finished? Except, of course, the Lord never told them to fast in the third place. Well, not on the fifth month. But what about the seventh? Just turn with me to Leviticus 23. Let's read. It's a longish reading, so we might read it around verses 24 to 33. What had God actually instituted on the seventh month? Instead of a fast for the healing and a fast for the wars. Leviticus 23, 24 to 33. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of, of, blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And also the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also the tenth day of this seventh month shall be the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation. Convocation there um, <laughs> for you. You shall afflict your souls and have an offering and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that day, say on that same day, for it is the day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people and any person who does my any work on that same day that person i will destroy from among his people you shall do no manner of work it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations it in your in all your dwellings it shall be to you a sabbath of solemn rest and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of that month at evening, from the evening to the evening. You shall celebrate your Sabbath. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles, for seven days to the, uh, the, to the Lord. Verse 34. 33. Thank you very much. What's the significance of the number seven in the Bible? It, it isn't God's number. It is the day of rest, the Sabbath. God rested on the seventh day. So, in the Jewish calendar, the seventh day of every week was the Sabbath, and the seventh month was the Sabbath month. That meant that they had to have a month where they didn't do very much. Now, Sabbath days were high holidays. They were required to be days where you were cheerful and joyful. On the ninth, you were to prepare for the Day of Atonement, possibly the most important, certainly to us, we understand, the one day that the high priest does anything. He gets up and he goes into the temple and he sprinkles the blood on the mercy seat and makes atonement for all the children of Israel. And so for these guys, they're too busy. They're fasting because Nebuchadnezzar broke the wall. And instead of having the Day of Atonement, Day of Atonement is a very serious festival. It's the one where our salvation comes from. Jesus is our great high priest who makes atonement for us. And here they are replacing it with the day the guy broke the walls down. Now what we read in Ezra 3, we're not looking for our own time, but for your notes, Ezra 3, verses 4 to 6, is that um, what happened when the the Israelites came back, the ones who did come back to build, before they'd even got the foundation, they reinstituted the Feast of Tabernacles and the Day of Atonement. So they were following it. But the other guys weren't. Even before Zechariah had started to prophesy, these guys had reinstituted, but those in Babylon were not looking to atonement. Nor did they want to know about a month with lots of days off in it. Why? 
because of the other guy that was taking his oath. The rest of the nations, the other people living in Babylon, were not taking a day off. How can I take a day off? I'm losing money. Last year, the entertainer refused to open it. <laughs> if you are a toy shop, the one day that is your cash cow day is being open on Christmas Eve. But it's owned by a Christian who goes to a church in Birmingham, and he didn't want to be open on the Sabbath. He was a big hoo ha. Even a protest, Paul signed a petition to force him to open. But he refused to open. That is not me saying you shouldn't work or can't work on the Sabbath, by the way. Make me understand every day is a Sabbath. We make high holidays of the Sabbath. But he understood that it wasn't about working as long as Toys R Us, because Richard was still, think, still in business then. It's about honoring God. And they didn't want to know, and now they didn't even want to know about their own self-imposed days off. We don't want to have a day off where I'm not eating. I need to keep working. Can we stop this now? It's silly. The, the McGrandad started this, and I don't want to follow that anymore. Let's get rid of this tradition. Let's go and ask God if he minds if we get rid of this tradition. See how he feels about it. We just want to get on with our lives. And having stayed where they were, competing against other businesses, ones who didn't have Sabbath rests, the business of religion was starting to become very inconvenient. And their temple was nearly done. So if we've nearly finished what we're supposed to be doing as a nation, can we just get on with our lives now and stop being asked to do things? Now, this is the time that I need to interject with a very relevant question. We can at this stage think that this whole message from Zechariah chapter 7 is really only to those who didn't return to build. We can see they're already in error by the fact that they've rejected their chance to build and by remaining away, and actually, what will happen to them is they will slowly drift away. And in the end, they will lose all notion of being Jews. And they will drift away to nothing until they become nothing more than magi looking for a star. So is this message really relevant to the guys who did come and build? and the guys who did listen to Zechariah, and the guys who have put it together. After all, it's their temple that's going to be torn down again. Not the temple of the guys who stayed in Babylon and built nothing. Have a look at verse 5 of Zechariah 7. Who does Zechariah, or should I say, who does the Lord address this to? So say to all the people of the land and to the priests. Everybody get in with me. Hang on a second. Why are we getting dragged into this? It's like when your brother's naughty and you end up being in the same room. You're both being told off because collectively we're being told off. And you think this is a great injustice. I have done everything right on this occasion. And why am I being told off? That's the face I get off my son quite regularly. Why am I being involved in this thing? Well, I am the good child. <laughs> hmm. The Lord directs this message to everyone, to the priests and to all the inhabitants, because what was in those not working was also in those who were. The same heart. Now, of course, the people working had gone a bit further with their conviction. They'd been able to do a bit more. But the same heart was still there. Let me make this clear what I mean. It's about the type of relationship the children of Israel wanted to have with the Lord. Well aware of his hand of, of correction, and the requirement of repentance on the children of Israel, 
all of the Jews spent this 70 years in a period of supplication, beating themselves with these fasts, showing the Lord that they were truly sorry for what they'd done. Look, I am doing all of these things, Lord, to prove to you that I'm very sorry. In order, most likely, to receive the same restoration that all those pre-exile prophets had been talking about. The one where God's favor is returned on Israel. Just like they'd all foretold. So that they would no longer be a subjugated people under the rule of other godless nations and they themselves would become the superior fighting power and all other nations would be under their rule. Now you might be thinking, Jamie, surely that's a bit far-fetched. Except that that's exactly how all the Jews of Jesus' time, including his own disciples, thought that the Lord was going to play it out. Lord, when are you going to restore the kingdom? The idea that those dirty Gentiles will stick their faces against the windows of God's blessing, looking in at the Jews who are bathing in their enjoyable trees that pick themselves and bread that kneads itself and harvest that cut themselves and turn themselves into bread and cows that deliver their own bacon. All of those things. I know, I know. We can't have pigs. That's unclean. Now, beef bacon. <laughs> Can't have chicken bacon, those are unclean birds. <laughs> no bacon. This is why I couldn't be Jewish. So they take that in. That situation. This is exactly their idea. It's the one that would cause Judas to rise up against Jesus and to try and force his hand. It's the one that caused Judas Maccabees and the Maccabeans to rise up against the Seleucid Empire in that 400 years of silence against Antiochus Epiphanes and that they would fight back. It's what caused the, the terrorists of Jesus' day to randomly stab people and take the peace of Rome and constantly keep killing. And it's in the end what caused the Roman Empire to send three of its largest legions against the whole Jewish state and painstakingly and slowly murder and butcher every single man, woman, and child that they could get their hands on to make the point abundantly clear to the rest of the empire, mess with us and we will butcher you. And they did a terrible, terrible job. So much so that the men of the most ardent fanatics who were fighting and believing that the Lord would restore the kingdom to them under a false Messiah bar coach bar that they chased after. They hid in the, the fortress of Nasiba, realizing that they had no chance. The Romans were very slowly building their own staircase to get to them. And they didn't care how many Roman soldiers died in doing it. They were prepared to spend everything to do it. They realized there was only one way out. And they stood in their own very large circle and drew their swords and stabbed the person to the left of them. In one mass act, we would say suicide, but really it's murder. Because they didn't kill themselves. Because God wouldn't like that. Only the things we can care about. That whole attitude. They wanted to be superpower. They wanted to be and have the favor of God return, yet they didn't seem to want to return to God. And they didn't want to return to build the temple, but they did want the temple to be rebuilt. Boiled down to it, they were saying, if I do this, be the ones that didn't come and the ones who did come, if we get this temple built, then God does. It's like playing the slot machine. I put my penny in, and I pull the lever, God has to pay out. If I do A, then God has to do B. 
if I'm repentant and I show that I'm really sorry and then I do the things that God has called me to, then God has to do them. Is that the restoration that the Lord prophesied in Genesis 3? No. Of course it isn't. The restoration that the Lord himself prophesied showed the relationship that we would choose the Lord when we had all the sin in the world to choose. We would choose him every time. The Lord could force a relationship on us, but he does not. Like any husband, like any wife, he wants to be loved for who he is. Not because he forced him to. He's not talking about us being his people. Although he is our king. And he is our Lord. He's talking about taking us from that servant life. And making us friends. And of course, that's the way it's best summed up. Just turn with me to John 15, 15. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Ultimately, it wasn't just they didn't know what God was doing. They didn't care what God was doing. If they just did what God said, then maybe they would get what God said he would do. Instead of saying, I have this opportunity to rebuild that relationship with them. In what way would you characterize the builders? Well, as servants, doing what the Lord told them. But friends know its reason. But the thing is, Zechariah 1 to 6 has showed us God's made it abundantly clear what the reason is. Haggai as well has proved that God has made it abundantly clear what the reason is. They've decided, I don't care what the reason is. I'm only building because I want mine. It's like the, and my mum and dad and their generation particularly. My dad never missed a day of work. But he's never worked 10 seconds over the time he was paid for. He can't get his head around me and my brother. Well, Gareth will still be in the office at 2 in the morning, turning up at 5 in the morning and working till 2 in the morning. And he just can't. He, it, it, it's, it's another world to him. He can't get his head around it all. Gareth loves his job. He loves that work. But my dad's from a generation where you work to live, not you live to work. So he didn't, he doesn't get it. And that's where they are. I don't care what your reasons are, God. That's fine. You want me to build it? I'll build it. Is that how you act with the calling that God has called you to? I don't care where I fit into it. I'll just do what you call me to do. I'll come and I'll do my bit and I'll go. And it really, whether it fits in or not, that's up to you, Lord. Hopefully you'll, you'll fill me with that favor that, and that blessing because I'm being obedient to your calling just like the Word tells me I'm supposed to be obedient to the calling. But it's more than calling. Because calling doesn't save you. Now, I have been harping on forever and still will. I get it tattooed on my face that I want you to find that good work within you. Do it and do it better. But understand this. God called you to that and created you for that. But he doesn't need you to do it. But he does want a relationship with you. And that's the most fundamental thing. That's the most important part of all of it. That's what you were called for. The Lord reveals to us, the reader, the heart of all, blatantly, was to just follow the religious order and receive some prescription. And as verse 6 said, what you do, you do for yourself. You don't do it for me. It was for their own benefit they did it. It's deja vu for the Lord. 
He said this to the pre-exile Israelites too. Prescription won't save you. But their returnable phrase, Ezekiel quotes it all the time, that they'll say, well, for his own name he won't do it. The Lord will never bring his judgment on us. We're his people. He's going to deliver us. As long as we've got the temple and we do the services and we do the ordinances and we do all of that, it doesn't matter. The Sadducees of Jesus' time were actually the priestly party. He tells us in the book of Acts that the Sadducees did not believe in the spiritual aspect of Judaism. They did not believe in angels. They didn't even believe there was a heaven. They only believed in the morality of law. And these are the people whose job it is to worship God on behalf of the rest of the nation. And they don't even believe that there is such a thing as heaven and God. Sounds eerily familiar to our own time. Was it the Bishop of Durham who once said that he was giving up reading the Bible for Lent? He's going to read the Quran for a month. So we could get a more rounded spiritual understanding. So here we go. We're back on it again. And the Lord makes it clear. Just because you said it was for the Lord doesn't mean it's actually for the Lord. Your piety does not impress him. The Lord sees the heart of man, not the actions of man. This is a line that the Pharisees still haven't understood. So Jesus tells them, you whitewash tombs. You may look good on the outside, but you are full of dead men's bones on the inside. So the Lord says, stop it, start it. It doesn't bother. Do it, don't do it. I don't care. It is not done in my name. It is not done for me, and I never told you to do it. And so the message now goes into this second prophecy by Zechariah, which starts then in verse 8. If you want to actually fast correctly, if you are actually interested in fasting, I'm not saying you've got to fast, I'm definitely not telling you you're supposed to be keeping these fast days, but going without food isn't actually the thing. Let me remind you what a fast is. And Zechariah quotes Isaiah here. Just turn with me to Isaiah 58. And let's just read verses 1 to 8. This is a true fast if you want to do a fast. Now, if you're doing a fast because it's a religious observance, it's a prescription, or you think you're going to twist God's arm behind his back, I really, really want you to do this, God, so I'm going to go without something today. That isn't a fast. This is a fast. Shout with the voice of a trumpet blast. Shout aloud. Don't be timid. Tell my people Israel of their sins. Yet they act so pious. They come to the temple every day and seem delighted to learn about me. They act like a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of its God. They ask me to take action on their behalf pretending they want to be near me. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We've been very hard on ourselves, and you don't even notice. (laughs) I will tell you why, I respond. It's because you are fasting to please yourselves. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarrelling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap and cover yourselves with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think this will please the Lord? No, this is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed grow fr- go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry. Give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. Do not hide from relatives who need your help. (laughs) Then your salvation will come like the dawn and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward and the glory of God will protect you from behind. Let's make it clear, this is not a command to fast. This is an understanding. If you're going to fast, and this is a fast, beating yourself with a stick is not a fast. I'm not impressed that you've just cut yourself for me because that's what the prophets of Baal do. I'm not interested in your hooting and your hollering and your scraping and your crying. 
I'm interested in your deeds, your heart, your actions, and the way that you are, the way that you believe, the way you act. So if you're going to talk to me about that, then you're going to behave in a right manner. And then Zechariah says, back in verse 12, this is exactly what the prophets told your forefathers. And guess what? They ignored him. It's all ably summed up by Jesus when talking to the rulers of prescription religion, the Pharisees. Let's turn with me to Matthew 23. And let's read verses 24. And you can stay in Matthew 23 for a bit. Matthew 3, 20, 24. Matthew 23, 24. Blind, guy, blind guides, you strain your, your words so you won't occasionally accidentally swallow a gnat, but you swallow a camel. Thank you very much. You blind guides. Make sure I've got the right bit of this. Sorry, verse 23, if we can. Or it should have been 23, 24. Follow away, it's you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income of from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. And those important things are justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. The Pharisees were all about what was on the outside. What is the point of tithing 10% of a mint tree? Because if you take a mint leaf and you take it off the tree, what's it going to do? Die. And it's no use nor ornament. But I'm giving God his 10%. That's pointless. Remember, Pharisees aren't priests. They're supposed to tithe. They don't receive a tithe. Pharisees are just normal Jews who are now have somehow become the guardians of the law, even though they were never even supposed to be the teachers of it. All of a sudden, these people are talking about a religion that's about prescription and is not about relationship. And of course, it's not a command to fast, but if you want to fast, then make it a moral and righteous one, not a self-righteous one. Standing on the street corners, looking sad, oh, I'm fasting today. Zechariah's message had previously been very positive. Now it was seriously cutting marrow from bone. Imagine going, what happened to him? He used to say such nice things. Now he's saying this. He diagnosed post-exile as to have the same sickness of pre-exile. Israel. Now, pre-exile's problem was idolatry. Post-exile did not have the problem of idolatry. The Lord had symbolically locked Israel in a cottage with a pack of cigarettes and told them to smoke them all. Simply because they'd now gone to a land where they had an idol for everything. You like idols? I'm going to lock you away with them. And so, they no longer loved the idols. They got a bit sick of them. But that really wasn't the problem. It wasn't the idolatry which caused the casting out. It was the constant failure to listen and to change. It was the constant failure to come before the Lord their God and to humble themselves. And the Lord made it clear to Solomon, if my people humble themselves and turn their face to me and to pray, I will hear their prayer. And that was a cast iron promise. God made it and God doesn't lie and God doesn't change his mind. So why then did they not turn to the Lord and say, Oh, these are wonderful. 
you excited? And the Lord said, it's not going to happen in your time. Why didn't the kids do the same thing? Why didn't the people do the same thing, but they didn't? Oh, they said, don't worry, God will save us. God won't let this happen to us. But they never humbled themselves. They called out to the Lord and cried. That was the problem. And doing the same thing over and over again will always cause the same results. As Einstein said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. If it didn't work for them, it won't work for you. But still, we keep trying it. In the beginning of the 18th century, the church was nowhere. Nobody went and nobody cared. Science was on the rise. So were things of thought. And in the end, the French Revolution broke out the idea of getting rid of monarchs, democracy for all, to the heart of mankind. And France declared war on God so firmly that they even got rid of the seven-day week and started the clock again at year zero. In Great Britain, that didn't happen. Although many people expected it to. It didn't happen because John Wesley came on the scene. And he started to preach the gospel. Nobody had been preaching the gospel before that. The only way that people got saved before that is they went out with a big stick and said, you accept Jesus as Savior? I will beat the living daylights out of you. Sounds like a good, good deal. Now he went out to preach the gospel so people could have a relationship. And the church went from being nothing to being something very powerful and making such a difference that it was a part of the actual life. And we, the church would be printed in newspapers. People like Spurgeon would have thousands of people at his church. Everybody went to church. The church was important. That message went out then with the various uh, adventures that went on in the colonial ones. And missionaries went out to the same places. And the message of Christ spread amongst all of the nations around the world. And then for some reason, the church decided that they didn't need to do that anymore. They were great and they were excellent and they were superb. And now what they needed to do was to go out and take care of the poor and the needy and do all of that kind of stuff. Of course, we've heard that in the past. But we need to preach the gospel. Now, that also can come with helping the poor and the needy and so on, but they kind of forgot the gospel and went that way. And what ended up happening is, of course, the church became very secular. And churches are about knitting clubs and drama groups and youth clubs. And so another revival began, and that was the Pentecostal revival. And out of that came a group of people that just literally despised any idea of a drama group or a youth group or anything. They just had church services where they preached the gospel, the Holy Spirit and the use of the gifts of the Spirit was in action. People got healed and people got saved. Now all of a sudden it seems that we've gone back to if we just go out to the poor and the needy and we give them food and stuff like that, then maybe they'll go, oh, Jesus is great. If you do the same thing over and over again, guess what results you're going to get? Exactly the same ones. It didn't work then. It didn't work pre-John Wesley. It didn't work pre-that. And it won't work pre-now. But as Henry Ford is famous for saying, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. This is exactly what happened. So how did that message go down with the folks? Let's have a look. Matthew 23. Again. And let's read from verses 27 to 26. Sorry, 27 to 36. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. Even so, you are also outwardly appear you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the, in the day of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are a witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents brood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from the city to, from city to city. That on you may come all righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. They murdered him. They didn't just kill him. They sacrificed him in the temple. Speaking the truth sometimes comes with consequences. Can't we have more of the first stuff? The stuff in the first book of Exodus. I call it that for you. You call it what you want. We like that. But now here's the message of religion. You'll follow a religious ordinance. You don't want a relationship with the Lord. You're not building the temple right because you don't really... You're not interested. You're just interested in what you get out of it. And it's been revealed by the nature of the fact that you've come and asked this question. And none of you guys dared ask the question. You've all been thinking it. I know you've been thinking it. The last prophet would be Malachi. By the time it gets to Malachi, he comes out and says, now everything you do is just out of fact, You don't even follow the law anymore. You are properly just going through the motions. And by the time of Jesus, that's exactly what you do. Even now today, in many of the, the various Jewish religions, and they are, none of them are mosaic, none of them are what the Old Testament describes the Kabbalah to the Zoroastrophari, all of the various bits of Judaic religion that comes out, they are all prescribed religion. Well, they're always looking for the way around it. You can't eat this biscuit on the Sabbath. But if we make it with apple juice instead of water, we can. That's not a relationship with the Lord. That's my kids trying to get out of uh, tidy in the bedroom. That's here's a group of rules. Here's a list of rules. I'm going to find a way around them. But that isn't what the Lord wants. He doesn't want a king and unsatisfied and people who didn't want to really be a part of his kingdom. They just felt they had no choice. He wants people who want him because he wants them. In the name of religion, mad men have gone and done mad things. That's the problem with prescription religion. But in the name of a relationship with Jesus, ordinary men and women go on to build boulders. And they realize it's not their power. It's not their might. And they say it's of the Lord. For the purpose that others may come to Christ. Not be shut out. So where is your heart? What is your purpose? Why do you even come to church? I ask that question so often and then say, you might as well go home. Or stay in bed. And that upsets people. They say I'm too flippant. But I say it clearly. Because if you're not prepared to have a relationship, you're truly wasting your time. I'm sure you could be doing far more enjoyable things. There's a lot on on a Sunday these days you can get involved with. If you're not interested in a relationship with God, then this is truly a waste of your time. But God wants a relationship with you. And he has made it possible that you can have a relationship with him. Don't do so you get. Just do because you love. Amen. Thank you all very much for... Coming, does anybody have any questions before we finish?
No. Let me encourage you then to take some notes with you. And if you're a hub leader, to take some questions with you if you so desire. Hopefully you'll enjoy sharing that one with your group. Yeah.